All right, good morning again. If y'all will open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation 4, we are now starting to move into, as we mentioned last week, the things that are hereafter. Remember, the divisions of the book of Revelation are the things which were, the things which are, and the things which are hereafter. And we are now in the hereafter. So, we get into, this is session 13, believe it or not, we are still in the pre-trib rapture. Uh, and as on the last session of the rapture series, which may be next week or the week after, I'll do a summary, a real quick scattergun summary of why no post-trib, why maybe pre wrath and why I lean more pre-trib. But as, even as we see today, we're going to see some reasons that it could be pre wrath but remember, one of the biggest obstacles for us. Good morning. For for yeah, we need more chairs. For the biggest obstacle for the uh, uh, even the pre wrath is that we have Daniel's seventieth week, and we know that's a period of seven years, and we know that seven years has been given to the nation of Israel. It's Daniel's very specifically. And the only way that we can get around it not being specifically for Israel is to spiritualize the nation of Israel and say that we are grafted in, therefore it's us. But I think that kind of that, that doesn't do justice to what we're looking at here. So, we have a throne. Uh, once I was in the Spirit. Now, what, what was... Uh, what happened in verse 1? Somebody read verse 1, because this is a great prelude. What happened in verse 1? After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Right. After this. After this. After the writing to the seven churches. After everything that's already been discussed. He hears a voice that sounds like a trumpet. And I don't think that's just imagery. I think that, that, that means something because we hear trumpets that are calling people up to come up here in 1 Corinthians 15 and in 1 Thessalonians 4. And the only other time that that particular Greek phrasing is used in the, in the Greek is in Revelation 11 where the two witnesses, when they're laying dead, they're resurrected. And he says, come up here. It's a, so it's, it's interesting to me. Remember, the, the, a lot of times in the Greek, uh, if certain phrases are used, you'll see them used at the, even though they, they could be used by the common man in different ways. You know, come over here, come up here. But when they're interpreted and they're used in the Scripture, you, you want to look for those common meanings. Uh, and one of the things I showed you guys on, on the Word, the, the program The Word, that allows you to do is when you get into the Word, the, that remember that free download that I encourage all of you to get, you can actually go into that module and right click and find every time that that Greek word is used. And it'll show you. And you can then figure out, okay, is this uh, in context? Does this make sense? You know. And sometimes you have these Greek words that are used a hundred times throughout the New Testament. Uh, but then you have these occasional words that show up once. And those are your real special words because, uh, you know, if they're used one time, you have, to, you have to go somewhere else to find the true meaning of it. And as I mentioned before, I use Thayer's. Uh, do you have a copy? Do you have Thayer's? I, I do not. You need it. Every person who's going to be working in the Word and ministry, you need, it's expensive. It was one of the biggest expenditures I ever made on books. It was... I think I got it on sale for 500, but it was normally like 1100 or something. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, it's the Greek lexicon, not Thayer's. I'm sorry. Uh, it's the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. It's a big series about that yes. long okay. of purple books. Yeah, I don't have it, but what I'm what I'm what I'm doing right now is I know this one does. Yes, so it's it's it. incredible. That's the one I'm because what it allows you to do. It, it allows you to see. Okay, there's a Greek word. This is what it means. This is how it was used by common people in the day. Like we mentioned the word agape. 
Well, that's we we like this. We have co-opted that word as Christians, and that means godly love. But it was a common word used on the streets, and it never meant godly love. What it means is self-sacrificing love, it, it, the placing the object of love above yourself. Because let's face it, a Greek in two B.C. had no concept of godly love. That was as a church phrase that we have we have made. So. We want to look at these Greek words, and we're actually going to do that today, too. So, uh, as in the Spirit, behold a throne in heaven, one seated on a throne. He who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. Seated on thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. So... We're going to talk today about the 24 elders. Now, first of all, they're elders. And an elder in the Greek is presbyteros. And what the, it actually has two different meanings. And it, you derive the meaning from the context. Okay? An elder, uh, and let's put it this way, uh, el the, the term elder really changes over history. Because who would be considered an elder 2,000 years ago is probably not considered an elder today in regards to age. All right? Uh, 2,000 years ago, I may be considered an elder. Because let's face it, people live to 40, 50 years old. The odd person lived to 70, 80, 90, or 100. But by and large, most people, the life expectancy on the planet was under 50. Mm -hmm. And it was really that way... Yeah, you know, that's one of the arguments about Social Security, them changing the age on Social Security. When Social Security was established, the average mortality age was 55. And so they made it, so basically that would be like saying today, if we establish Social Security today, that'd be like saying, okay, it's 84. So in other words, Miss Gundy would have been on Social Security for six years. That's the same if we scale it that way. Everybody understand where I'm, I'm giving that? So, an elder has two meanings in the New Testament. First of all, it's an age thing. Respect your elders. How many of you grew up hearing that? I mean, that was, you know, drummed in my head, and rightly so, and it's drummed in my kid's head. You respect, respect your elders. But secondly, in the New Testament, in what we call church polity, elders, you can be a 30... 25-year-old individual and be an elder. And what elder in this sense means in the faith. It's an elder in the faith. Uh, what are the three divisions of that we have in, in, in our levels of faith? Uh, 1 John 2 talks about them. What are they? The three divisions. It's in 1 John chapter 2. I believe it's around verses 10 to 15. It's, we have three divisions. John says, I write to you blank. I write to you. I write to you little children. And then I write to you young men. And I write to you fathers. And we've talked about this on some Sunday nights. Uh, what is the prerequisite for being a father? Say it again, Dana. Yes, children. You have to have reproduced yourself. Now, it doesn't being a father doesn't make you a daddy. We're not going to go down that argument. Anybody, if they can reproduce, can be a father. Some men are fathers of ten different kids by eight different women. They're still fathers. What a father does in a spiritual sense is read somebody who has reproduced himself. That means it doesn't matter how mature you are in the faith. If you've never reproduced yourself, you're not a father or a mother. Point blank. Okay? Um, so we have, and if we'll look at second, we'll look at 1 John 2 at a, at a future date, but it's very important that we understand that there are divisions. That even, you know, John was talking about these divisions. You know, basically, young babies, you're saved. And as I've mentioned more than one time, you can be a baby your whole life. You could have never matured past milk. 
And the writer of Hebrews talks about that. In Hebrews 5, well, my, the very first verse we looked at, Hebrews 5.14. But solid food is for the spiritually mature, who have, their, who have their powers of discernment sharpened through constant practice to determine the difference between good and evil. All right? And then we have young men, and, and basically they're a little bit more bolder in the faith, just kind of like young men are. You know, uh, they're, they're a little bit more vigorous. And then we have fathers who are usually calm, cool, and collected, and they reproduce themselves. So, in that sense, these are elders. These are elders in the faith. And they're, seating on, they're seated on thrones, they're clothed in white garments, and they're wearing golden crowns on their head. And we see in Revelation 5.8, and let me read that real quick, that they perform a priestly service. It says, And when they had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp, a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So it is these twenty-four elders that actually are involved in the prayers of the saints, getting them as a sweet savoring offering to heaven, to God, to the throne. So they have a priestly service. So as we look at who these twenty-four elders are, this is extremely important. How many times is the church mentioned after the, at the, by the, after the close of Revelation 3? From Revelation 4 on, how many times in the book of Revelation is the church mentioned? None. None. Except for, we have 24 elders. Now, the question is, do they represent the church? That is how we figure out who these guys are. And knowing that John is told that these are the things that come here after, this is something that happens afterwards, it's really important that we determine who these guys are. Um, Tell them something like it's the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes. And we're going to talk about that. Okay. Yeah, and, and, cause, and actually, this is, I mentioned last week, this was uh, one of the theses that I wrote during my master's, uh, the 24 <laughs> elders. And I actually, all of this that I have, I actually had to go back. And I realized, you know, it's amazing you write this stuff and you spend so much time writing. And it's amazing how much of it you actually forget. Uh, and that was one of, the, one of the theories. And we'll look at that. Uh, matter of fact, there are three predominant theories. First predominant theory is that they are angelic beings. And if you look at older commentaries... Uh, remember what we said about the Word of God being revealed over time? If you look at older commentaries, you'll see that a lot of them spiritualize this and they say they're angels. But we know that they're not angels. Uh, Revelation 7-11. All the angels were standing around. How many of the angels? All of them. And around the elders. And the four living creatures. Notice the divisions? So the 24 elders are not angels. They are not the four living creatures, which are the spirits of, of God. And we'll talk about that at a future day. They're separated, so there's three separate categories here. <laughs> if the elders were angels, you wouldn't need. It would have said, and the angels and the elders, the angels or elder. It, it would have said something different, but it categorically splits them up. All right? So we know that they're not angelic beings. And we also know that from... Uh, for some other things we're going to look at. Theory two is that they're representatives of the Old Testament and the New Testament believers. So that they're representatives of the 12 apostles and they're representative of the 12 tribes of Israel. Finally, that they're representatives of the church after the rapture. And this is where I, this is the category I go into and we'll see why. And again, this is my, this is my own personal thoughts. I challenge you to look at it and come to your own conclusion and if you come to a different conclusion, we're still friends. All right? Because remember what I said. Who's, if, you, if, you, if you teach long enough, and I've been teaching for over 20 years and not near as long as some of you have. If you teach long enough, who's a false teacher? We all are. We all are. Okay? Everybody's got something wrong, and I guarantee you something I'm going to say in this class. Today probably is wrong. And that's just the price we pay for looking through a mirror dimly. All right? Okay, so we know they're elders. They're presbyteros. They're seated on thrones. Does this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Revela it ought to. Revelation 3.21. This is the, to the church of Laodicea. 
To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne. And they will sit down with my father in his throne. Thrones are promised to overcomers. Is this promised to the Old Testament? No. No. Thrones are for rulers, right? You see in the New Testament, the church age is pro the church is promised to rule. We're going to rule who? We're going to judge who? Angels. <laughs> so this is a promise to the church of Laodicea. So that's promise number one. It reminds me of the Mount of Transfiguration where they said, who will sit on your right when you're and That's right, and that's exactly what they were looking for. Okay. They're clothed in white garments, and that means purity. Now, these are promised, white garments are promised to not only Laodicea, but also Sardis. Notice it says, Sardis is told that those who have not defiled their garments will walk with me in white, for they're worthy. So now we see another promise. We have these promises. See, that's why it's so important that we spend the time in Revelation 2 and 3. And get, before we can get to the juicy future stuff that everybody's interested in, you've got to lay a good foundation. So we know that Sardis is promised to walk in white. Well, here we have elders that are what? Walking in white. Do we think that that's just a coincidence or, or, or happenstance? And, or, that John just lost his mind between chapter 3 and chapter 4 and forgot what he wrote about? No. And the one who overcomes and conquers will be clothed in white garments. Is that the garment of the martyrs as well? It is. It is. And the Laodiceans of Jesus asked them. See, they thought they were well clothed. Remember what one of the things Laodicea was known for? It was known as a big textile commerce place. A lot of textiles were made there. And uh, Jesus said, you think you've really got some good, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue clothing, but you're really in filthy garments. I want you to buy me some white raiment. They were wearing golden crowns. So there's two words. Anybody, anybody studied enough? Greek, I'm looking over there. Mm -hmm. The two words for Greek in Greek are okay. Diadema and Stephanos. Or Stephanus. And it all depends on where you put your little accent. <laughs> and which accent you put. There's three accent marks in Greek, by the way. And that's really confusing. Yeah. 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 So you got you got you got the little Upside down circle, and you got a dot, and you got a hash, and then it's just... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I just would always just get yelled at for mispronouncing. <laughs> so, a diadema, that's a royal crown. That's something a king wears. All right? If, if we are talking about crowns in Queen Elizabeth, she has a diadem. However... A Stephanus is a victor's crown. That's the crown that when you were competing and they put the little olive wreath, you know, what did Paul say? Everybody who competes are competing for a what? A crown. Only the victor gets the crown. Do they get, did they get a crown for second place? No. That's why Paul says, I, I, I beat my body. I, I'm just, you know, I'm trying to get this victor's crown. And in the Greek, that word, it, it's not a, a diadem, it, it's a victor, it's a Stephanus. So, to Smyrna, he says, I will give you the crown of life. All right? That is the Stephanus of life, the victor's crown of life. And then to Philadelphia, he said, I'm coming soon. Hold fast so that no one may seize your crown. Now, what is the two, what's, what's the two important things about these guys, these two churches? What do they have in common? Both get crowns. Well, both get crowns. This was the second church. And what does Smyrna mean? Anybody remember what Smyrna mean? Sure. Sweet smelling, incense crush. It's, it's the, the, the martyrs, the crushing of the martyrs, and it was symbolic of the crushing of the herbs there. It produced a sweet smell, and it went it meant sweet smelling under under persecution, basically. So the thing that these two have in common are these are the two churches that did not receive condemnations. 
and they are both promised crowns. So we have uh, Sardis, we have Smyrna, we have Philadelphia and Laodicea. And they're all promised to either be given thrones, white raiments, or crowns. So in the world of laying out circumstantial evidence, that's a lot of circumstantial evidence that these 24 elders are representing these churches. Because Jesus says, if you overcome, that now, when you overcome on this earth, are you going to get your crown on this earth? Are you going to be clothed in white raiment on this earth? Is, is a throne going to fall out of heaven? No. This is all for your future reward. So if it's all for a future reward, and that, and that happens at the Bema seat, we know that, 1 Corinthians 3, what does it lead you to believe that has already happened by Revelation 4.1? The Bema seat. The judgment seat of Christ has already happened. If these people have already been given their victor's crowns, they've already been given their white raiment, they've already been given their thrones, they have already been given their rewards. So somewhere between the end of Revelation 3 and the beginning of Revelation 4, when John is told to come up hither, and let's really break it down, somewhere between verse 1 and verse 2 of Revelation 4, the Bema seat has happened. Mm -hmm. That means that if we follow it in chronological order and say that John, and John says it, or Jesus says it, I'm going to show you the things which were. Mm -hmm. And it goes in chronological order. Were, are, will be. And as we walk in chronological order, that means that somewhere between verses 1 and verses 2, we've had the Bema Seat Judgment, which we know happens after the rapture of the church. Mm -hmm. And now everything else that's going to happen in the remaining 18 chapters is after the rapture. That means all the seals, all the trumpets, all the bowls, the, the two witnesses, the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, the second coming, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the New Jerusalem, eternity, all of that happens between verses, uh, happens after verse 2. Okay? So, last thing we're going to look at is they, they look at a, they have a priestly function, and we read this. Uh, they hold the uh, prayers of the saints in full of incense. And so they're messengers. They're messengers, and that was the function of a priest. Now, as we discussed a little bit last week, who are the priests today? We are. And what scripture is that? It's in First Peter. You are a priesthood. A royal priesthood. First Peter two. Look at. Look at nine. Chosen race, royal Okay, read it. Read it aloud, Andrew. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. So, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. This is where we look at whether or not that that theory number two is correct. Who? had the promise in the Old Testament of priesthood? Say it. The Levites. Okay? If you weren't a Levite, you weren't a priest. Okay? If you were a tribe of Judah, you could be king like David. But you could never be a priest. See, remember what Saul's big downfall was? What, what started Saul's decline? He offered the sacrifice because he got impatient. He was waiting on Samuel. Samuel was delayed. He got impatient and he decided that he was going to take the priestly duty. And God said, that's it. I'm done. And we need to remember. That that's an important sidebar. We need to remember that when God says, I'm done with you, it may not mean that he's going to do it tomorrow. Remember, it took quite a while for David to get the throne and to not have to fight Saul. I mean, he fought Saul for seven years after you know David was anointed and the king. And God is incredibly patient. And sometimes we forget that. So that is not a function of the Old Testament believers. So therefore, 
I don't believe number two is true because they are carrying out a priestly service. Old Testament saints did not carry out priestly service. Only the tribe of Levi carried out the priestly service. Remember, everything in the Bible is important. Even those little subtle things. It all means something. And part of the great treasure hunt, and that's what we call Sunday night, is the great treasure hunt. Part of what the great treasure hunt in God's Word is, is figuring how it all pieces together. Because it is all one giant jigsaw. Except for the problem is there's no picture to go by. That you can go, oh, let's go, that's an eyeball, and it goes up here somewhere. It's, it's, it's like putting a jigsaw pe a puzzle together, and it's 10,000 pieces, and you don't have a guide. Eventually, you can do it. But it takes a lot of inspiration. So, let's talk about crowns real quick. What? Okay. I can do it. Crowns. So there are there are several crowns. Let's see, we look at good time. Imperishable crown. That is for faithful endurance. First Corinthians 9, 24 through 25. Now these will be on the website and uh, in the class notes. So uh, the, if y'all writing them down, just you, you'll have to wait until I send those out because we need to move here. The crown of rejoicing, that is rewarded with your salvation. The crown of righteousness. That is for all those who love His appearing. You know, I would say the very yeah. fact that you're in this class and you're learning and wanting and eager to know about the second coming of Christ, you probably are going to qualify for this one. Right. How, what the standard is, I don't know. I mean, do you have to be rapidly obsessed like me? I don't think so. I think there's, you know, the, you know I may be going overboard here because I want another crown, right? Uh, hey, get them all, right? Yes, sir. You think that also has something to do with how you live your life? If you don't live your life right, you're not going to be... Yes, to and that is, that is true. Uh, because if you truly love His appearing... You're ready. You're ready. You're living in a, in a way of expectancy, and you're living in a way of comforting one another with these words. And as Peter says, you're living a holy life because you never know. It's right around the corner. The crown of glory. That's for soul winners. Now I know I've got this crown, and that you know, and I kind of even though this is not biblical at all, I, I kind of picture you know a jewel in your crown for every soul you've won, and it, it's kind of like one of these things that we have on our Air Force ribbon rack. You know, you get a little bronze oak leaf cluster, and then when you get five of the awards, you get a silver oak leaf cluster, and, and maybe you know you get a ruby, and then for every ten you get a little diamond, and then you're going to have guys like Billy Graham and Billy Sunday. They got these big old crowns of just diamonds all over the place, right? Uh, I don't know how it'll work out. I don't. But it, it's interesting. And, and so, pursue the crown of glory. Now, every one of these, except for this last one, you have an option of getting. This last one, you sometimes don't have a choice. Alright? I cannot make myself a martyr. If I try to make myself a martyr, then I'm probably not a true martyr. But we know right now, during the fact that we've been going for 30 minutes, that someone has earned this crown. Probably more than some, more than one. This crown, right now, is being mass produced in heaven. Because literally hundreds of people a day are earning this crown. So those are your crowns. So, we're going to switch gears. Open your Bibles now, and we'll get back into Revelation next week. But this, this actually dovetails into it. Get back, uh, go to 2 Thessalonians 2. Remember, this was in your homework. And now it's coming due. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So, let me give you some background. What has happened is someone has spread a rumor in a church. Somebody spread a rumor in a church. I can't believe it. I can't, I mean, it never has happened before. But are you speaking the truth? No. I'm being very sarcastic. I'm being so sarcastic. It's... No, I'm showing here that it actually happened with a church that Paul founded. 
He had actually instructed them. And someone had snuck in, either with good intentions or wrong, and scared the daylights out of the Thessalonians. They were terrified. And so they write Paul. They're like, we missed it. All that stuff you ta taught us, all that, what happened? We, we ain't seen no resurrection of dead people and we're all still here. Well, we're, we're scared to death. Because why? Because they think they're in the day of the Lord. I mean, all you got to do to see that the fact that the day of the Lord has come, in other words, it's past, it, we've already had, it's begun. And the Thessalonians are like, they heard that Paul has said, we're in the day of the Lord. We, we're familiar with doomsday prophets, right? People, you know, Harold Campings and uh, May 14th, 19, whatever day, you know, 1994 or 2012 or whatever it is. We're familiar with that. Well, that's what had happened. And so they're scared to death that they have missed it. Because we know what Paul taught in 1 Thessalonians, and we'll look at that. So the Thessalonians, the Thessalonians had heard a rumor that the day of the Lord was happening. They thought they had missed the rapture. Because remember what Paul said. You're going to be gone. We're going to be changed. The dead in Christ will rise first. The only way that this makes sense is that Paul had taught them the rapture of the church before the day of the Lord. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been shaken. They wouldn't have been scared. They would have been, oh, right, we're here. Let's go. The day of the Lord is here. I'm ready. No, they were scared to death. And every one of them is sitting there thinking, well, Paul said that the rapture happened before and then the day of the Lord. Why are we all still here? We have missed the rapture. We must be lost. That is what they're thinking. That in context of the of two passages and their state of mind is the only interpretation that makes sense is that they think they have missed the rapture of the church. Let no one deceive you in any way for that day will not come unless a rebellion comes first. Now, what Paul is going to be doing now for the rest of this chapter, is he's going to be reiterating what he taught them. He's going to be telling them, okay, let's go over this again, guys. Rebellion first. The day, the day of the Lord, and we, and see, here's one of the problems that post-tribbers get into, people who believe in post-trib rapture. They want to take the day of the Lord seriously, literally, like it's one day. And we absolutely know from the context of Scripture that the day of the Lord is a season. It's a period of time. Mm -hmm. Because all the stuff in the, in the book of Revelation from chapter 6 on is not happening in one day. Because we have demons running around for five months. We have all of these, and we all know that all of that in the context of the Old Testament is a period. The day can mean season. That's one of the, the whole arguments about is it a literal six days of creation or is it a period? Uh, the Greek word there can mean literal day or it can mean a period of time. And the same thing in the, in the Hebrew. So, the day of the Lord will not come unless a rebellion comes. Now, there's that word for rebellion. It means apostasy. Apostasia. Uh -huh. and, and see this little dealie, this little guy right here? A little minor Greek lesson. There's your accent mark. This is an H. You ever want to know, like harpazo? Remember harpazo means the snatching away, the catching away? This is where you get that little accent. It's called a breathing mark. And what it means is to go before you pronounce the rest of it. Hypostasia. Okay, there, there. Now, now you, you're a little smarter. Okay? I was a little boy. You were being a little fun. Yeah. Yeah. And see, because this one's a slash and not an upside down front or a frown, it, it, yeah, it's crazy. So it means a falling away, a defection, or an apostasy. Now, what's interesting is that the first seven English translations render it as departure. And in the Greek, it can mean, it, in the Koine Greek, the common language of the day. See, this is another word, apostasy, that we have spiritualized and put into the church. Hi, David. We put into the church as meaning an apostasy, that he's an apostate. They're, they're, you know, they're teaching apostasy. 
right. which is things that are contrary to the doctrine of faith that it calls you to lose your salvation. But in the common language of the day, it literally meant a departure. Now, it could mean a departure from a place or a departure from a thought. It, it's really that open-ended. Um, bingo. So, the definite article... The is used. Now, in the beginning, the, the most important definite article you will ever know of is in John 1, 1 and 1, 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. And what like Jehovah's Witnesses have done is they've taken out the definite article and they say in the beginning was a Word. And, and that one little definite article means so much. Because what it means is it points to a specific thing. It doesn't mean, and we talked about this, the cup as opposed to a cup. If I say go get the cup, you have to know which one I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. If I say go get a cup, you get a cup. It could be this, it could be this, it, you know, it could be anything. But the definite article is used, and so it is a clear event. It's not a set of events. It has to be one specific event because that Greek definite article is used. So, it can, it can refer to a departure from the faith or a literal departure of the people. So, in context, what Paul could be saying, and I'm not saying he is, and, but, and believe it or not, this could be one of those things where it could be both. We have a lot of scriptures that are dual fulfillments. They're double fulfillments. The same verse fulfills two different things. But he could say, for that day will not come unless the departure happens. In other words, unless there's a departing of the people. And that could be a, a, a reference to the rapture that the Thessalonians would have gotten. Because they're speaking Greek. And he spoke Greek. So here's the bottom line on this. We don't know. We don't know. To be safe, we probably want to say it's an apostasy. It's a departure from the faith to be safe. Because we see that in 2 Timothy 3. Remember we talked about when we discussed discuss the letter to Laodicea. We, we talked about 2 Timothy 3 where, it, where they say basically that people are going to be departing from the faith left and right in the latter days. So. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God for declaring himself to be God. So that day, the day of the Lord, is preceded by the departure, whether it's from the faith or actually a departure of people, and the revealing of the Antichrist. In other words, the day of the Lord cannot happen until the Antichrist is revealed. And the Antichrist is revealed at the abomination of desolations. We know that. Now, it's possible that he's revealed before at the signing of the treaty, but we know for a fact he's revealed at the abomination of desolations. And that's from Daniel 8.12, Daniel 9.27, Daniel 12.11, and Matthew 24.15. Remember what Jesus said, When you see the abomination that causes desolation, as spoken of by the prophet Daniel, you who are in Judea will get out of here. Amen. And I hope none of you are pregnant and nursing infants, and I hope it's not on a Sabbath for you. Which means that for some reason these people are still going to be obeying the law because they're worried about traveling on a Sabbath. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? See, Paul had already explained this sequence of events when he was in Thessalonica. And we know he, when he was in Thessalonica, Acts 17.1, when Paul and his companions had passed through and fit in Phyphilus, in Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. This is the second missionary journey. This happened probably in the spring of 50 AD. And so Paul is there and he's explaining, hey, remember when I came to you and I founded this church, I stayed there and I taught you these things. And now you've forgotten them. You've forgotten them and you've allowed somebody to come in and scare the britches off of you. And you think that now you're in the day of the Lord, and I told you guys, the day of the Lord's not happening until there's an apostasy first, whether that's departure of the faith or departure of the people, and the Antichrist is revealed. You see an Antichrist? I don't see an Antichrist. That's what Paul is saying. And you know what is restraining him. This is when we'll finish up. 
that had been revealed in this time. We talked about the restrainer. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now is restrained will do so till he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The no. lawless one. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt you. Sure. But, um, so was Nero in power at this point? No. Okay, go ahead. No, no, Nero was not. Although they did, you know, Nero wasn't until about, well, when Paul, about 10 years after Paul went to Thessalonica okay. the first time. So lawlessness that spawns the Antichrist is already at work. We need to remember that. We see it every day in our world. The thing that will spawn the Antichrist, the evil in the world, is already there. John says that in 1 John 4, 3, 4, 3. He already says, hey, there's lawlessness already there. But the fullness of lawlessness will be fully revealed when the restrainer is taken out of the way. Now, this is where we get into this, who is the restrainer? Some say Michael the archangel is a restrainer. More likely, though, it's the Holy Spirit as seen in the indwelling of the church age saints. The very fact that the church is here and the Holy... Remember, the Holy Spirit works differently in this dispensation in the New Testament than He did in the Old Testament. The, the Holy Spirit worked individually in the Old Testament. He, he worked through people specifically and at specific times and would come and go. And believers, He's here. He's indwelling us. Well, we believe that what this restrainer is, is the Holy Spirit. And when the restrainer is taken out of the way, in other words, literally removed, mm -hmm. how, if the church is here, how can the restrainer be removed? Is the Holy Spirit going to leave you? No. I think that's a promise. And Jesus said, I, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And, and that promise is fulfilled in the fact that the Holy Spirit indwells in you. That's the comfort <clears throat> He sends Him. So the only way, if the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, the only way the restrainer can be removed so the mystery of lawlessness can be revealed is that the church is no longer here. And at that point, you know, we often think about where are we in, a, in, a, in, the, in the, the stage and everything, and, and, and can things get much worse? I want you to imagine just for a second, if the church is not here in this country, and the Holy Spirit is absent from this country. What do you think happens? Lawlessness. 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 When mortality puts on immortality, believers are changed. When we are caught up, caught up, which is harpazo, the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. The Antichrist cannot be revealed until that happens. Until there's a falling away and departure and a restrainer. So those are the two things that prevent us knowing who the Antichrist is. Now... I know Jesus would never tell me the day or the hour, right? He's not going to tell me that. Well, I figured out a loophole a long time ago. Yeah, I think about it. I mean, this is one of those things you, I sit there and I think about. If I could ask the Lord one question, and, the, and of course he would say, you can't ask me when the rapture is, I'd be okay with that. I want to know the date of the Antichrist's birthday. Because if I, if, if I see the Antichrist is born in 2175, then I'm going, okay, we're cool. But if I see like 1945, you know, that's just my little loophole. So, I know it's kind of crazy. You also just thought that, uh, sure. that when we talk about times like that, mm -hmm. that only God knows, right. um, we tend to think in our minds that it's a set time. Right. It may or not, well not be. It may depend on the way we interact with God and the right. way the world interacts. And it, it could be that God's going to make it happen when, when certain things ripen. And they'll write them differently right. depending on how believers interact with the world. Yeah, and that is it, it that be a set time. Well, and that's where you go, that's where you get into the sovereignty of God issue. Because then what that would mean, and I know what you're saying, because I I do believe that from our point of view, our human point of view. Yeah. But see, God knows. He already knows when this is gonna happen. And if he changed his mind, it would mean that he didn't know he was going to change his mind and he was wrong about that date because, you know no, what I mean? That's not what I'm saying. No, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. And, and it's, one of, it's one of those things that, to me, is such a deep mystery about God. It's, we, we see in the Old Testament that you know, he calls he people to certain things that sometimes right. they do and sometimes they don't. Right. And then the outcome of what they did. Correct. And it's, I think it, it, it's a matter of perspective. 
It depends on yeah. from whose perspective you're looking at, whether you're looking from man's perspective or God's perspective. You were I was going to say, to me, it's a little bit like when uh, Moses goes to Pharaoh and right. he's talking people go, you know, it says, when Pharaoh hardened his heart, and eventually says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Right. From Pharaoh's point of view, it's not like he goes, well, God told me to say no. Right. Actually, it's like Pharaoh still, in his point of view, his perspective, saying no. Yeah. But this time it's God causing him to say no. And I think God does what you're yeah. talking about. For our, he does it for our benefit, you know, to show, you know, and that's where God, when it says God repented a lot of times in the scripture, right. uh, did God really truly repent in the way we look at it? No, because God's not going to, there's no shadow of turning with God. He's not going to change his, he's not one to change his mind. He knows, because if he could change his mind, then that means he didn't know he was going to change his mind, which means he's not all knowing and we know that that can't happen. Right. But I think it, it all depends on from our, from our human perspective. That, that a lot of times God will lead us into thinking, you know, you know, because it's for our edification. It's the way the Holy Spirit works. He He leads us down these paths so that we can grow and we can see that yes, I am that Almighty God is using us for His glory, and that is just spectacular. But He went the laser thing. If my people will do this, and, and we see that promise in Second uh, Second Chronicles seven fourteen. We know what the ultimate outcome is going to be. But right. How it gets yeah. there depends on. And how it gets there is a, it's a crazy road. Yeah. You know, and again, I don't think anybody knows the exact path we take to get to that destination. Right. And God, see, and, and, that, and there you go. God used a man who tried to run from God. But God knew exactly what was going to happen, right. you know. But he he knew he wasn't going to destroy Nineveh because he knew what what Jonah was going to do. But yet, he came from the per human perspective of I, you know, there's an unknown here. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. But it's like you said, it depending on our action. Even though this other side of God, he knew exactly what. Okay, you know, let's see. Uh, He's going to do this, and then where's this going to happen? And then we're, you know, he's going to go. And I just, I, I love the story of Jonah. And I don't think, I, I picture Jonah preaching to Nineveh, and I don't see him very enthusiastic. Yeah. Please repent. The Lord will destroy you. Please yeah. repent. How far does he go into the city? I don't even think he goes there. It's like a day's journey. Yeah, it's yeah, it's like a day's, yeah. Just for the computer. So. All right. Well, there we go. We got to get going. Uh, there's your reading assignments. Continue basically the same one. Uh, we will be moving on into Revelation four uh, and five next week. So I should have put Revelation five on there. So let's go, to the Lord, and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, and Lord, I thank you for the the deep things that you have that are hidden treasures in your word. Father, I thank you for the intellect that you give us, Father. And we know that all wisdom comes from the Holy Spirit. Father, the uh, Father, there's a spirit within man, and the breath of the Almighty giveth him understanding. So, Father, we thank you for those times that you give us understanding. Mm -hmm. Father, but we're also thankful for the times that you hide things from us, and you cause us to work for it. And we're thankful for the growth that comes from that. Mm -hmm. Lord, I'm thankful for our, our ladies, Lord, and the great time that they had this weekend, and the time of refreshing and the smiles and the laughter that I'm hearing. And we give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.